Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Uh, what I want to talk, oh, I know what I want to talk about, this. <clears throat> so, my mom says to me, is this thing real? Uh, I wish, I don't know where the video is, though. Let me see, it shows, kind of, uh, Musk along with footage. Hmm. It's an interesting fake. Anyway, so they, they took authentic footage of Musk speaking at a real talk rally. I'm not sure. Oh, that's eight. That's an hour. Or public discourse. That's not going to work. Anyway, so there's this fake video going around of Elon Musk talking about quantum AI. My mom, and, and what they're doing is they're telling you, they're telling, it's aimed at Australians actually, but they're telling people to invest $400 and that will guarantee them a lifetime income, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and they, but the thing about the fake is, and I can't find the fake, they seem to have taken it down. But the thing about the fake footage that my mom sent me um, was that it took an actual speech he made and footage from an actual speech he made, all with all the trappings of the, you know, said the news channel and so on and so forth. And it changed what he said using his fake voice. And it even changed the way his lips were moving to match what he was saying, to match what he was, they were making him say. And so he was talking about this investment opportunity and his, this is a new company's launching, blah, blah, blah. And he wanted people to get in on the ground floor. So they were only doing it for only $400 and whatever. Now, what's interesting is every everything you go to, like here, it would send you to a what looks like a real news site for the real Toronto Star or whatever, right? But it's all fake. They copied the website, they copied the links. Everything has been adjusted just a little bit so that it looks legitimate. But this learn more new automated trading platform, right? And, and again, I'm getting this from a site that's exposing the hoax, so it's, it, it may have disabled these things. Uh, so people don't, you know, so you're not looping around and doing it. But again, using AI, and this isn't AI's fault, you know, it's not the evils of AI, this is what people do with technology when they have it. But unfortunately, AI now makes it easy. They, can, they could fake Elon Musk, they could fake what he says, they fake the interviewer interviewing him. So they had, the, they had a track of this woman interviewing him, who's a legitimate known person in, in Australian news, they used her voice. They had her interview Elon Musk, and they took footage of her interviewing Elon Musk about something else at some point. And they just made them say whatever they wanted to get people to go to the site and legitimize it. Um, then when they put the link on, they faked the link to the news site. And now they faked the whole news site and recreate it except for inserting their own links. And it's kind of, it, it's you know, it's a little disconcerting because you really can't trust anything you see. Um, and, and with the election coming up, I think that's pretty relevant. I mean, you can't believe what, uh, you know, people say, people are going to accuse the candidates of saying things that they never said. People are going to show you videos of the candidates and it's hard to get it out of your head. Like they just had a fake thing of, uh, Trump hanging out with Jeffrey Epstein. Um, Trump did hang out with Jeffrey Epstein, but he wasn't you know, not as hanging out as they make it in the video. They make it in the video like they're at a strip club together or whatever. Um, you can do that now. You can make up anything you want. And it's so confusing. Even for me to explain it, right? It's like, well, did Trump hang out with Epstein or not? Yes, Trump was on Epstein's plane seven times. That's a fact from the flight log. But we're not too far off from all of that being fakeable. And, 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 you know, and, and in fact, they just had a thing where John, I think it was John Kerry or somebody like that. They put him with Jeffrey Epstein, never happened. You know, it's just, you know, it's crazy. But the problem is, you know, we have this very deep sort of seeing is believing kind of thing ingrained in us as human beings. And when you see a picture, um, let's say Trump, Epstein. See, you don't know, I mean, you don't know if they're real or not. Fake, this one's fake, they say that's, there you go. Look at that. <laughs> I mean, that's, you, it's hard to see in this, 
it's hard to unsee it. So these these are fake, and oh, and that's right, and, and they they fake Bill Clinton too. You know, this is real. <laughs> He really did hang out with Jeffrey Epstein. They really were girls, but they weren't little tiny girls. That's that was, that's a sick picture. Um, but what's real? What's not real? How how on earth are we going to know anymore what is real and what is not real? And um, <clears throat> here, 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 oh, here you go. I mean, that's not good. Ugh. So anyway, it, it doesn't matter if somebody tells you it's fake after the fact. It's like when you see the pictures and you remember them in your head, it's a very strong association. It's very hard to get rid of. And I guess, I guess over time, we're going to train ourselves not to believe anything we see. But you know, we you know, I'm 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 60. It's my whole life. A picture is a picture. You know, I mean, you know, of course it can be fake, but you know, it's it's a lot of effort. And generally, when you see something, it's like, oh, okay, that happened probably. I mean, now anything can be anything, but it's not just that, as you saw with the um, the Musk scam. Financial information is fakeable now. Company information is fakeable now. Rumors about the company, uh, quotes from the Wall Street Journal, even things on the Twitter account of, of major companies like the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg or whatever. You can't believe anything. It's all hackable. So, look, fortunately, for the kind of investing that we do at Phil Stock World, we are fundamental long-term investors. We specifically don't respond to these rumors and wild things until we check them out. Um, for our kind of investing, it's going to be a golden age. People, the people who get sucked into these things are the people who jump on a bandwagon or dump out of something because they hear a rumor or run into something because they hear a rumor. That's going to get manipulated all over the place. And, the, and even worse, you know, so much trading is done by computers now that the, the trend following is going to be is going to get to insane levels. Now, there's great ways for us to take advantage of that going the other way. But still, we're going to have to be rock solid sure about our facts. You, you know, it's it's not a good time to be a short-term day trading kind of investor because you don't know what, you're just going to get manipulated all over the place. It's, it's much more sophisticated than it used to be. Even when you go to verify something, they can have layers, as they did with this Elon Musk thing, there can be layers of bullshit that, you, that look legitimate. You know, they, they just, um, you know, I mean, you, you do Blomberg and see, you know, it's like, here, look, B-L-O-M-B-E-R-G.com. So if you get sent to Blomberg.com, I don't know if it's an actual website, doesn't seem to be. But if you get sent to Blomberg.com, here's Evan Blomberg. And it turns out that she is some kind of violinist. <laughs> So there's, there's a tip for you scammers. Blomberg.com seems to be open. Um, if you So if you get sent to an article and it says Blomberg.com slash slash blah, 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 and all this information, you would very possibly not notice that it didn't say Bloomberg and it said Blomberg. Um, that's really dangerous. There's a lot of stuff like that that's happening. It's happening now, but it's going to start happening on levels. This must thing was scary. You know, I, well, so let's see what the PolitiFact said. We just looked at this one. But this is scary because it has backing. I mean, if you read this article, which is RMIT on it, um, you know, you can earn $3,000 selling shares with high returns, minimal risk. Mr. Musk says in the video, the tool will make you financially independent. Uh, 27,000 views. Um, you know, it's, and it's using real footage of Musk talking. I wish I could show you the video because it was a good fake. It was really, it was really good. 
is PolitiFact. I guess, I guess these kind of sites are going to get to be more and more. Now, and, that's, and there's another positive, though, of course, the companies like this are going to have their own AI that's going to check the things to see. But, you know, you're going to have to know to, to check on these sites and find out if things really happen and so on and so forth. You go Quantum AI official trading website. Uh, I don't know if this is the same thing or if it's something else. Who knows? <laughs> and that's the thing. How do you know if anything's real? How do you know if it's right? Um, how the viral quantum AI spreads online. Let's see. Stable. I don't know. Apparently, this quantum AI scam has been around longer than the Elon Musk thing, but they use the Elon Musk thing to um, to get people over there. It is all over the place, this thing. Look at it. It's like an old... And what's Elon Musk going to do? It's, it's very hard to go around and stop this sort of thing. Elon Musk video, fake. Yeah, see? Now there's the California version of it. Fake tweets, Facebook videos. Probably where my mom got it from Facebook. She doesn't do TikTok. <laughs> God, God forbid she starts doing TikTok. Let's see if anybody has any comments about that. And uh, Randy says, you know, it's just a mess with the, you know, we, I mean, I, I got to tell you, democracy doesn't work that well if you can't believe, if you don't have good information. And that that's what's going on. We're going to have a crazy, crazy year, unfortunately. Anywho, so that's where we are for the moment. That's what we talked about last week. Tomorrow I do my portfolio reviews. Got a lot of homework before I get there. I'm not done getting all my updates and everything. Oh, the beige book. I thought we were having the beige book today. Ha! <laughs> That's what I wrote about. Um, yeah, we got the things going on in Davos. Your body already has built-in weight loss system that works like blah, blah, blah. blah. Food and your gut biome. Yeah, well, that's great if it wasn't destroyed by plastic and stuff. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. It's a good image, though, isn't it? <laughs> so um, we'll check out the Beige Book latest. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we talked about Chinese property. And this is bad. Look at the Chinese property indicators, right? I mean, last year, this was our top concern. You know, I, at the beginning of last year, my top concern was the Chinese Chinese property sector collapsing and taking the whole world with it. It didn't collapse. They did a lot of stimulus and bailout and stuff like that. But now we're right back and it's still going down. I mean, it's how, much, how often are they going to be able to spend this money and bail everybody out? And all they're doing is kicking the can down the road. There's nothing been fixed. You can't. And you can't fix it because it's so much money. It's trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. And you can't, you know, we, we did the same thing with our banks. We only kicked the, the can down the road um, by, by having this FDIC backup thing. Um, insuring the accounts doesn't fix them because there's no, the money isn't really there in the insurance. There's not enough money to pay out the, if, they, if they default. It's just a, it's just a, a calming down peak thing. It's so easy to set people back to panic mode. Here's China. Um, they had two. They have two million less people than last year. That's that's freaking crazy. Having population decline. These are the births. Deaths don't go. The the deaths don't go down generally. The births go down. And um, and they've had significant fall off in births. I mean, I, I, I mean, significant is not even a word here. I mean, it's sort of 50% fall off in births since, uh, you know, 2017 around there. 
And that's not good. That's economically terrible for a country. Um, and they've got the real estate issue. So who's going to live in these stupid, who's going to live in these buildings if there's no people? Um, our own thing, retail sales were an improvement this month, but they're still pretty damn bad. They've been falling off for a long, long time. Um, oh, we're we're turning over $2.2 trillion. There's five point, you know, about 5.6 trillion total of commercial real estate loans. That's that's from commercial banks. There's other there's other real estate loans out there besides commercial banks, but on the commercial bank side. Um, $2.2 trillion of commercial real estate debt is maturing over the next four years, so $500 billion a year. So 10%, which makes sense, 10% per year is rolling over. And it's rolling over from 1% to 5.25%. That's devastating for people who have to roll over their loans. Um, it's going to be a huge problem. And it's going to, uh, prices will go up. You know, what happens is people... We talked about this, I think, so I don't want to just think a long thing about it, but I remember last week we got the compound rate calculator out and stuff. Um, but but it's the biggest issue of, of this year is going to be things like this. It's going to be real estate in China. Re real estate around the world with higher rates is going to be a disaster. And it's not going to be fixed by going from 5% to 4%. 4% is still way, way up from 1%. And those are the and those are the Fed funds rate. That's not the the rate they're paying on the building, but it's the same spread. It's basically it's going to be three percent more um, than they paid before, and that's a lot. It's basically double of what most people are paying um, in interest. So the you know the stages of that is the landlord now. It's the landlord who's paying this, right? But they're paying three percent more on their uh for their rent they have to pass that along obviously they don't want to take a loss they're going to pass that along to the renters and the renters are are sitting on 30 percent unoccupied space because of the work at home trend so so one third of all occupied space 20 20 percent of all commercial space is unoccupied completely unoccupied nobody's renting it right of the rented space of the 70 percent that is rented or 66% or whatever you want to call it, but of the, of the I'm sorry, 80%. 20% it's 20 completely empty nationwide. So 20% of the real estate completely empty. 80% that is occupied is only two thirds utilized. So basically it's 0.66 times 80. So 52.8%. That's a devastating number. So when you're talking about rolling over, you're gonna the landlord's gonna try to pass on an increase to the tenants. The tenants are already sitting there looking at a one-third empty office. They are absolutely going to downsize. They're gonna re either re they, so the, all the renegotiating power is on the tenants. This will force landlords into uh, bankruptcy because nobody's going to buy your half empty building where the tenants are the trend of the tenants is they are leaving and your rent and now your mortgage is much higher than it was when you bought the building so the numbers don't work on the building nobody's going to buy it from you uh and take the and take the kind of hit you're the guy took the loss so the and and of course it's not that hard to go bankrupt when you're a commercial uh um property owner unless you're a small guy who guaranteed it personally or something like that but for the majority of these landlords they're they're you know they're they, they, the corporation was formed specifically for that rental property and so they just walk away basically they just walk away and the rental pro and the company that you formed to buy the building goes bankrupt and the bank is sitting on the loss all right but then the reality though is so the bank let's say has a building that's only worth 55 percent or 60 percent of what it was they don't want the building if they're lucky they've recouped x amount right so over the years if uh it's a 10 million dollar building and they were collecting a million dollars a year in uh in loan repayments and and the interest right 
So after five, let's say it's from five, let's say five years, they collected $5 million back. So their outstanding balance on it is only about 5 million bucks. That works out for the bank. They just dump it for $5 million and they're happy. They just get their money back and they're, and they're like, good, okay, at least we got our money back. We might not have made money on the interest, but we got the money back that we laid out for the building, plus deposit and whatever, right? So now when that happens, that's actually beneficial, except for the other problem is now the other buildings in the area are having comps and they're competing with these uh, bank owned buildings not to mention when somebody buys the building from the bank they have a much lower cost basis per square foot and now they're competing against the other guys who are already under pressure um with their own interest problems and so on and so forth so there's a push pull on that but the, for, you know in, initially this is how you can have a real big real estate collapse if the collapse is too big then um, uh, then the banks take a hit also. And so the banks take a hit, the property only, the property companies take a hit, the management companies take a hit, the um, uh, the tenants make out like bands, they're the ones that, that end up benefiting from this stuff. But initially the tenants have to pull back on space and so on and so forth. But then bargains will abound and this is how it regrows, it has to crash in order to grow again because it had because without the crash the prices don't adjust to normalize but this is a cycle it's a very it's a long slow rolling cycle but but to to shorten up what i'm saying basically so the 52 percent occupied building gets sold at half the price the original guy had at half the price but more interest so now that's good though for the bank because now the bank has a guy who has low cost renters and has good prices and bought the building for half the price the other guy bought the building for. So the other guy took the loss, even though the bank technically took the loss, but you know, the, the banks, it all works out for the banks because they always get bailed out. But the bank basically takes the loss the rental company has gone, the, the, the company that was owning the building before it disappears into a puff of smoke. Um, the building uh, is resold for half the price or 60% of the price it was originally sold for. The new landlord now has a lower cost basis. He can rewrite leases with the existing tenants and bring new tenants in at lower prices. That's going to force other buildings and building companies to go bust also. But what it's gonna do overall, all of a sudden, all these unaffordable cities are now 60% lower, you know, are now at 60% of the cost of where they were before. And suddenly businesses can afford to go in and start up and retail space can get filled up by companies who can afford to uh, hang out for more than a few months before they go broke renting a place for too much money. It's a virtuous cycle in the end, but it's a long, painful turnover. And, and we're only at the very beginning of it, but that's, that's where things are right now. It's, it's got to, you know, it's something to watch, but I mean, we did, we went through this in 2000. In fact, and I sold, I had a, uh, a property data company in 2004, and I thought the market was going to collapse then. So in 2005, I sold the company, uh, got a great price for it because I, you know, I mean, literally things, housing was turning over. Uh, someone would buy a house and flip it six months later. So that's why our business was so great was because, you know, it was like insane amount of turnover because people were speculating in the housing market. And I was like, this can't last. People can't afford these things at a certain point. It's like hot potato, right? At a certain point, somebody can't, can't take it anymore. <clears throat> so I sold in 2005. I could not believe that in 2006 and 2007, the market hadn't crashed yet. I was like, damn, I could have squeezed two more years out of that thing. But in 2008, I was freaking thrilled that I sold it because everything collapsed in 2008. But it takes a long time. And, and you know, I've been talking about this for a couple of years now, and it is very much like that time when I, when I thought that everything was going to collapse, and it just keeps going and keeps going. The banking crisis that we had last year in March was indicative of coming to the end of that cycle where had, had the government not quickly stepped in and done something about it, then we would have had all sorts of shit hitting the fan. And we will again, it's just a question of how much the government is willing to spend to forestall the, the disaster. Um, here's retail sales, we talked about that. The retail sales came in pretty strong for um, December. 
We ended the year on a high note. Um, overall, we're up 3.2% from last year. Not, I mean, nothing incredible. We're up 3.2% from last year. Um, Eight trillion dollars. <laughs> that is a lot of freaking merchandise. So that's pretty incredible for a year. I remember, I mean, pre-COVID, we were seeing retail sales with $6 trillion. So, I mean, this is a massive increase. Uh, it's inflation, though. It's not, people aren't getting more stuff. They're spending more money for the same stuff. 3.2% is not even keeping up with inflation. People are buying less stuff for more money. That's what this reflects. So, um, without motor vehicles, it's only 3%. Um, gasoline came down, furniture down 5% this year, building materials down 3%, gasoline down 11%. There's gas stations, that also includes like candy and whatever you buy at a gas station, but overall it's mostly gasoline. Not that much really, $650 billion. I mean, ten, I mean it's not 10%, but it used, it used to be 10%, but a bit less than 10% of all retail spending is gasoline. So it matters a lot. When it goes down 11%, that means that money goes to other categories of retail and they benefit. Department stores, minus 2.7. Ooh, that's not what you want to see if you're a mall person, right? Um, Non-store retailers, non-store. That's interesting. That's up 8%. That would be... Um, you know, internet, non-store retailers, Amazon, people like that. And so it's interesting going through the individual categories. I wonder what that is, 45M, in the middle of the video. Uh, anyway, what time is it? 1.30. All right, so it's starting to go through our... Um... Oh, 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 this was also very important. Wait, let's go over this. Do, do, do. I thought I had something. Here we go. Biases. That's what I want to talk about. So there's an article on uh, Barry Ritholtz's page saying what investors really want. He interviews it's, a, it's an interview. And um, they talked about, um, you know, what investors are trying to get. And it's important to understand this about yourself. You may need, it's good to like reflect on these things when you're investing and, and think about, you know, what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong when you're trying to buy things and trying to make money and what your motivation is. So let's just quickly talk about some of these things. Um, there's emotional benefits and behavioral biases that investors seek emotional benefits. Um, it's like when you buy a lottery ticket, you know, it feels good to believe that there's a chance that you can have, uh, you know, three hundred million dollars or five hundred million dollars or whatever. That, you know, you get it. You know, if you buy a lotto ticket, and as stupid as I think it is, I buy uh, a lotto ticket sometimes because if the Mega Millions is a billion dollars, and I know the odds of three hundred million to one of winning, I say, well, you know what? I'm getting three to one better odds than I should. So. <laughs> Basically, is basically how I look at it. So I'll like, yeah, I'll give him a few bucks and say, yeah, yeah, give me one of those. Um, it's just fun, and it, it's that it, the fun of it is the fantasy of winning a billion dollars exists for you. It's a it's a, a quantum event, basically, right? It's like Schrodinger's ticket. It's like it, it's it, it's not a loser until you find out for sure it's a loser. Obviously, statistically, it is almost certainly going to be a loser. And, and it's an idiotic thing that people do. And I'm telling you, I know it's idiotic and I still do it. Um, not a lot. I mean, I bought maybe last time I bought a lottery ticket is probably a year ago. But, you know, if I see a, a crazy number and I happen to be standing at the supermarket and they're selling it, I'm like, oh, okay, sure. You know, here's an extra five bucks. Um, I usually give it to, I usually give it to my mom or something or my brother. I'm like, you know, it's just fun. But that's true about stocks also, you know, it's like people, it's not fun to invest sensibly. And, and again, going back to this is how we invest. This is how we teach people to invest. It's to invest sensibly with the vast majority of your money should be invested in sensible things. 
Um, it's not fun though. You're not you're not going to get rich. In fact, especially um, the way we hedge our bets and then sell call options, it's the opposite. It makes it impossible for you to have those great big gains. It's you know we're saying if we make 25% on this option, it's going to now be in the money, and we're not going to uh, make any more than that. That's the most we can possibly make. Now, of course, the way we set up our spreads, you're getting a huge return on cash, a couple of hundred percent, but it's still not infinite. It's a grind. We're grinding out money and making consistent cash. Um, that's a great thing, but it's not, um, it's not, that doesn't give you that sense of thrill like a Bitcoin, you're like, oh, this Bitcoin can go to a million dollars or, you know, so, I mean, you know, and that's why also the, the the reverse bias is there because it's like you know at some point Bitcoin's worth less than a penny and now they're forty thousand dollars. So you think, well, if, they, if somebody made forty thousand dollars off a penny at one point, now I can turn forty thousand dollars into whatever. That's not true either, because there's a concept of how much money can conceivably go into Bitcoin. It's not. It's easy to go from a penny. So let's say there's 11 million Bitcoins, right? So at a penny, all Bitcoins were worth $100,000. And now uh, all Bitcoins, so there's, 11, there's still 11 million Bitcoins times, well, let, actually, you know what? We should draw it out. 11, so don't make a mistake. 11 million Bitcoins times 40, uh, maybe $45,000, right? And that's $500 billion, all right? It is possible to go from $100,000 to $500 billion because there are $500 billion in the world, all right? But to go from, ah, how would I do the math? Oh, obviously times. So to take that number and now multiply it by, uh, 45,000 pennies, right? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Hang on, Google will tell me. Control C. Uh, what is that? Uh, header equals exa. What is that in English? What? How do you say? I don't think Google even knows what it is. <laughs> it's a big number anyway so that's but there's my point right so it's not you can't that's more than all the money in the world you cannot cannot expect the same returns from bitcoin now that somebody got for the last 10 years it can't happen so when you see the curve going up and up and up for bitcoin So, you know, when you see, yeah, like this. Okay, so let's say it's here. I don't know what number that is particularly, but that looks about right. So when you see these sharply rising curves of Bitcoin, you're like, oh, I got to get in on that. You got to think to yourself, and let's see if this has numbers to it. Oh, oh come on. Advertisements, that's a, I can go on on that all day. I'm not going to talk about it. Advertisements have gotten completely and utterly out of control on the internet. Somebody has to stop them. They are they are now taking up your screen. I mean, it's like it's just nothing. Look at this bullshit here. Look at it. They have no regard for your time, whatever you call it, you know, your attention. They don't value you. It's insulting. It really is. There's no numbers here. Oh, it's a stupid chart anyway. 
All right, anyway. But when you know when you see it here, and this is forty-five thousand dollars, you have to think of it. No, it's not forty-five thousand dollars. It's five hundred billion dollars, half a trillion dollars of Bitcoin. And if it goes to here, that's another half a trillion dollars. And then you're to a trillion. Then this is two trillion. And this is four trillion. This is eight trillion. And this is sixteen trillion. Is sixteen trillion dollars really going to go into Bitcoin? And if not, then it's not going to be mm, whatever corresponds, like let's say let's say 50, 100, 200, uh, 200, 400, 800. All right. So let's say eight hundred thousand dollars of Bitcoin. Ugh. I mean, this is disgusting, right? Every pop up, pop up, pop up, Ow, video, all, and this is freaking Forbes supposedly a legitimate website. I mean, it's disgusting. So 800, really? So $800,000 times 11 million is probably also gonna give me an error, right? Oh no, it's not. Um, that's gonna be $8 trillion, right? Is that trillion? No, there's, there's a million, billion, trillion. $8 trillion. So an $800,000 Bitcoin is gonna be pretty simple, right? It's $8 trillion. Um, it's every hundred thousand dollars of Bitcoin is a trillion dollars. So I can tell you right now that the limit for Bitcoin going up now is 20 times what it was before, what it is now. Not, not, uh, not four, <laughs> shit, <laughs> 45,000 and it used to be a penny. So we add two more zeros. So 4.5 million Bitcoin has gone up. 4.5 million times since it started. I mean, you know, let's just call a penny where it started. So Bitcoin has gone up 4.5 million times since it started. And people are buying it, looking at these graphs and extrapolating the curve and saying, oh, it'll go up another 4.5 million times. I'm going to be so rich. No, it won't. There is not enough money in the universe for Bitcoin to go up the, at the rate it's been going up. It can't happen. It can go up about 20 times from where it is now. That would bring it to $800,000 per coin. And at that point, it can no longer double because it cannot suck up $16 trillion and be as big as the NASDAQ. It's just almost an impossible concept. That much money cannot be allocated to one asset class unless we have, you know, rampant insane inflation and money is meaningless. But I mean, in, you know, given money at the structure we have now, it's not going to happen. And that's why, getting back to where we were, that's why you have to understand these things. You have to be aware of your biases and aware of your irrational thinking in, in the context of your investments. You have to look at something and step back and rationally think about what is actually happening. It's nice to think that, oh, I love Bitcoin because it could, be, it could go so high. No, it can't. Just like Apple can't suddenly be a $6 trillion company. You're buying Apple now at 180, and you're thinking 180 is not so much, but the reality is 180 is $3 trillion. How are they gonna get to $6 trillion? And I wrote an article telling you how Apple will get to, to $6 trillion, $5 trillion, anyway. I said Apple will get to $5 trillion over the next 10 years. That's realistic, that's growth. But it's not gonna jump up to $6 trillion. And frankly, if it goes to $4 trillion, you probably should short it the next year or so. It's too much. What are they going to do to justify that? Where are the sales going to come from? Where are the earnings going to come from? That goes back to risk reward dynamics. <clears throat> and, and that's an interesting concept too. I never really think about it that way, but there's two things that happen when you're investing. You want to be rich when you start, but then when you start losing money, you don't want to be poor. And everybody goes from greed to fear. And so when people start losing money, they start panicking because they're worried about losing and being wiped out. 
when you start, you're greedy, you want to get rich from a stock, but then when it turns on you and goes the wrong way, you suddenly are scared it's going to take all your money. It's an interesting concept. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's funny because the minute you enter into the relationship, which I guess is not much different than a girlfriend, but the, you know, when you enter into the relationship, all of a sudden the rewards are no longer evident and it's all about the risk. <laughs> And your relationship changes drastically. And that's what happens when you buy a stock. It was all very enticing when you didn't own it. But now that you own it, you're more worried about it going down than up. Um, and again, it's, it's all about balance. And, and, and again, we, we sell and we hedge and we do what we can to, to minimize our risks. Um, talking about personality and culture, certain people, they're talking about as, as an investor. When you're an extrovert, you're more risk-oriented. Um, the U.S. cultivates a risk culture, whereas other companies uh, like China are less likely to approach a risk in the same way. Um, there's You have to objectively uh, assess your performance. That's really important is to step back and watch it. You know, that's why I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, tracking things and going back and reviewing, constantly reviewing, it's making sure you know what you're doing, you're on track or off track. And then, um, and this is uh, this is Warren. He's our Chat GPT guy, and um, and he started talking about how the article underscores the importance of psychological emotional value. So this is the more valuable part, frankly, from the review. Um, and he talked about what we teach specifically at Phil Stock World. And so, you know, we stress the importance of of recognizing and mitigating the biases in your in your investing. Um, we always tell our members to be aware of these biases, try to be more rational, make informed decisions, don't get swayed by emotion and don't chase things in the market. Um, balancing risk and reward is, is what we're all about with our options strategies and portfolio management and especially also diversification. Don't let your portfolios get weighted to one thing or another. Just always look to diversify. Say, hey, I've got too much tech. I should buy something else. I need to sell some tech and buy something else. You want to balance your portfolio and um, not, you know, not to ignore the trends, but there are plenty of trends to invest in. Like we've got, um, we went over our 2024 trends, and uh, obviously AI is still something to invest in. The chip sectors, robotics healthcare because you have an aging population we, we we just did this we just did this was our first our first webinar of the year was that um but there's you know so within within the trends that we want to be in there is still quite a bit of diversification biotech is another one so that doesn't go away but so there are there are you know maybe 20 30 different categories of things you can invest in pick 10 for the year and go that way take the 10 that are most likely to do well this year And hedging is crucial, of course. Uh, cultural and personal influences, you know, you, you have to recognize, again, your own, you have to be reflective and think about yourself. You have to psychoanalyze yourself. And frankly, if you don't, if you're not good at that, always you can talk to the AI. Tell the AI to psychoanalyze you and, and, and discuss with it your, your strategies and let it suggest where you are. Uh, objective performance tracking. And again, that's something we obviously hammer on and an educational approach. Um, we're all about education. We're all about teaching the technical, the fundamental aspects of trading. You know, we don't we don't go for this TA bullshit, frankly. Um, and also you have to understand the market psychology of other people. You know, your investment is, is going to be a reflection of what people are running into and running out. Of. See, this is interesting also. Money market fund assets. Look what's happened since COVID. People have taken a huge amount, $1.5 trillion since COVID. And this is money that the government was trying to put into the economy. And instead, it's gone into cash, money market asset funds. And they talk about how it's a record amount on the sidelines. Now, when you hear there's money on the sidelines, you tend to think, ooh, money on the sidelines, that means what? That means people are going to run in and invest. But I'll say no. Because does the money come off the sidelines in January? In, in 2008, we had the big crash, right? 
and money did come off the sidelines here, but the market was like ridiculously cheap. And people started putting money back into the market. In um, since then though, no, people started putting, when Trump became president, people started putting more and more money, 2.5 to four, then four to 4.5, almost five, right? And that was because COVID happened. All of a sudden, people put a ton. People were putting money in. Then COVID happened. People put way more money in. They took a little bit out, but then started putting it right back in. This is an, a mindset has changed. Okay, people are not rushing back to throw this money back in the market. So when you talk about sideline money, look what look. In fact, look what happened when you see a buildup of sideline money. It's a buildup of sideline money, buildup of sideline money. The crash didn't occur till late 2008. Money coming in from the side does not mean that it's going to boost the market. It means you're heading into a recession. And people take more money during the onset of the recession and put it into cash. They get more cautious, not less cautious at the outset. So when you look at this and you think, oh, money's going to come off the sidelines, no. This is an indication that people look at the market and say, no, thank you. I'd rather have my money in the bank. It's an indication the market's too expensive. It's not an indication that people are waiting to get in and they're going to suddenly, because that, that's what everybody wants, right? You want the bigger fool theory, the greater fool theory. You want somebody with more money to take your stock off your hand for a higher price. But there's an assumption there that there's always going to be a greater fool. And that doesn't work. That's why it's called the greater fool theory, not the greater fool uh, uh, theorem. <laughs> it has not been proven and it often does not work. So that's something to be very, very, very well aware of. So looking at... I don't know if this has been refreshed any time. Nope. So, you know, we reviewed the 700 a month portfolio last time we did this. Hasn't changed. That's changed. Actually, it went down two thousand bucks. So we took a hit somewhere. Not sure where. Um, where did we lose two thousand bucks? Wow. Oh, these puts. Look at these puts are killing us. Oh, not puts. Sorry, the calls. I'm getting killed on these short calls. Um, that's the worst thing I see is these short calls are, are knocking us down. Some power is still not doing good too, you know. But the, it's it's the hedges are what saves you in these situations. Although the short-term portfolio, I'm sure, is doing definitely worse than it was because we've gone up since. But we're still at 347. So 347 plus the long-term portfolio, and this number is not been updated. But 347 plus. 743, still about 1.1 million. It still is. So they're basically hanging out at about the same rate. Um, that That's what it is. So see, the, the long-term portfolio goes up, the short-term portfolio goes down, they end up balancing each other out. And that's what you want when you're uncertain about what the market's going to do. We don't know what the market direction is going to be right now for the year. Uh, we We were cautious, and that's why we've got our hedges up. And this little dip isn't going to reflect in the short-term portfolio, but it's already knocking the long-term portfolio down. But we have the hedges. The hedges will kick in. And that's not a theorem. That's a, that's a, I mean, it's not a theory. It's a fact. It's a theorem. Um, and uh, notice the VIX is shooting up. That's also, by the way, as a big sign, right? This is a daily chart. The VIX just pumped up tremendously. Um, so we got to keep an eye on that. Uh, oil, uh, I don't know. I, I guess we're going to have our oil report tomorrow, but oil's hovering down here. 
Um, this line's been holding well though. If we get back to 70, it's almost it's almost a good idea to go long. This channel between 70 and 75 is becoming pretty reliable for the moment. Natural gas came well off its highs. And uh, gasoline also down in the channel. I mean, they, wh where's the catalyst now, right? What more can they possibly do? The Red Sea, we're already going around the Red Sea. So we're not using the Red Sea to, to transport oil. That's already baked in. What's going to be next? When the Red Sea reopens, then oil is going to take a massive hit. You got to be real careful with that stuff. Here's the notes of pulling, pulling off their highs. Uh, cocoa is really bamming up for whatever reason. Sugar coming off the lows. We talked about that that bit a while ago. I was like, 20 is a good floor for sugar. Orange juice, uh, orange juice is getting a little cheap too. It's also going to be an interesting play. Um, lumber is reflecting the downturn in the real estate market. Gold, big dip. 20 touched 2100 a couple of times, and now back to 2000. So 2000 should be bouncy. It could be an interesting play. Silver, we need a bigger view. See, that's the problem because, you know, if, two, if 2000 breaks, there's no support until 1900, really. So you can't, you know, if you're going to play, you want to play for the bounce only with very tight stops below. Silver has really good support at 22. So I would love to pick up some, I'd like to play silver at 22 for sure. 20, I would be, you know, is to me a long-term investment line. I think that's fair. Copper can, was, was on a nice run and pulled back. Everything's pulling back. Why is everything pulling back? China. You know, that's what we talked about this morning. China is in trouble. And if China's in trouble, everything's in trouble because China is, uh, uh, what are they got? 1.4 billion people. So that's going to be about 20, you know, it's getting towards 20% of the world's of the world population. 1.4 divided by eight. 17.5% of the entire population of the planet is China. So when you're looking at things like, you know, soybeans, they, this is what they use. They are the users of these things. And uh, another problem that we're having for the market right now is that people are running back to the safety of the dollar. That's also a huge thing. So we're going to see what the Fed Beige Book has to say, and we'll see if you guys have anything to say. Any questions or anything? Nope, no commentary there. So let me just take a look at the daily chart. Oh, dear. Falling back to the lows, down 188 there, down 45 on the S&P. 200 on the Nasdaq. Oh no. You know, but it goes back to the same thing though. It's in the grand scheme of things, this is nothing. The Russell is showing the most problem, right? This is the weekly chart now. It's always good to change your perspective, right? So you can see where things are. So on a monthly, it's not even a flutter. The Russell never got back to the highs it made in 2021, 2022. Never made it back to that. And it's it's once again struggling at 2,000. In fact, it's once again rejected at 2,000. Even though these are monthly candles, you see the story is the same. Rejected at 2,000. After an overshoot, it is rejected at 2,000 in the grand scheme of things. The 2,000 line is very, very tough for the Russell to get over. Um, and, of course, look at the consolidation here, right? So you got great consolidation on 15,000. Clearly, that's the 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 line. So, fifteen thousand somehow it went up to, to twenty four thousand. It was an overshoot, um, but the reality is it's back under twenty, and your lines are going to be one thousand point lines. And so that's a strong that's a weak retrace. Strong retrace is eighteen. Weak bounce is sixteen. Strong bounce is seventeen. That's how the lines are going to look on the Russell. These guys are all still at the top of their ranges. They're not. They, they, there's not even damage here. This is just a healthy consolidation for these indexes. Unless they fall below their previous high, their previous highs, all this is is just consolidating above the line to to start moving forward. The Russell is not consolidating above the line. It's consolidating below. This probably indicates though that these guys are going to have a stronger pullback than this. So we'll see. I and, and again. It, 
it's just that's just TA looking at something like that. But the reality is, it's I don't mind calling the TA shot, even though I don't believe in TA at all. But in reality, there's fundamentals underlying this. The Nasdaq and the S and P, <clears throat> the Nasdaq's trading at 30 times earnings here. That's that's what's causing the top. 30 times earnings is what causes the top. That's too much. I don't care. I don't care what you think your prospects are. That's too much. And that's why we're getting these, these hard pullbacks. So, oh, could we get back to sixteen thousand very easily? Could we get back to forty six hundred here on the S and P? Absolutely. Where's our where's our charts? Here's the S and P chart. So 4,600 is where the 50-day moving average is, but look at the 200-day moving average is flattening out. That's not good. That's not what you want to see if you're bullish. And on the NASDAQ, we've already called this, it's an overshoot. The top of the range on the NASDAQ should be 15,000, not even 16,000. The 50-day moving average is not over the 15,000 line yet. And we had talked about this, that 70 was going to be too much on the RSI, and it was, right? That's exactly where we topped out, was 70 on the RSI. So, excuse me. And and also, we see the MACD. Now, this is going to, this line here is going to cross, the short-term line is going to cross under the red line, and that did not work out last time very well, right? We had a sell-off from the summer until the fall when the when the short term line crossed under and look at this time when the when the short term line crossed under that's ugly as hell right so be careful that's that's basically the summary of what i'm saying here is be careful now let's see what the fed's beige book has to say um fed beige book Do, 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 do. Is this the right one? Today is January and it's not out yet. Oh, wait. Wait, last update January 3rd. No, that's not today. It's got to refresh. Oh, there it is. Magic. What is the beige book? About this publication. Where? Wait, wait. That where is it? I never saw this before. This is weird. Oh man, I don't have to click on everything, do I? Why? Oh my God. It's not long, you can just read it, but. Do, 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 do. I don't know. Let's see if. Fed's inflation outlook, blah, blah, blah. Do we overload them? I don't want to overload them. what we're talking about there okay do refresh just in case okay new topic here is the fans beige book um for january 17 Please summarize and analyze. Okay, it's Claude. And then we'll do it ourselves and we'll see what Claude has to say. So, what if I click on this? What does it take me to? Oh, then it's details from each of the banks. Okay, so let's stick with the national summary. 
A majority of the 12 districts reported little or no change in activity. Of the four districts, differed three reported modest growth, one reported moderate decline. Consumers delivered some seasonal relief in the holidays, um, exceeding in three districts, including New York, which noted strong holiday spending. Additional, in addition, seasonal demand lifted air freight volume, e-commerce in Richmond, credit card lending in Philadelphia. Several districts noted increased leisure travel and tourism. A context described New York City as bustling. New York City hasn't bustled in a long time, so that's pretty good. That's good, frankly. Uh, context nearly all districts report decreased manufacturing activity. We're seeing that in the manufacturing reports. Districts continue to note uh, high interest limiting auto sales in real estate deals. However, the prospect of falling rates was cited by numerous contacts as a source of optimism. So in other words, the belief that the Fed is going to lower rates is keeping people optimistic, even though they haven't actually done it. <clears throat> Concerns about the office market, weakening overall demand and the 2024 political cycle were cited as sources of economic activity. <clears throat> Overall, most districts indicated that expectations of their firms for future growth positive. Seven districts described, now seven out of 12, always keep that in mind, it's 12. Seven districts, little or no change in overall employment, while the pace of job growth was described as modest to moderate in four districts. Two districts continue to note tight labor markets. Several described hiring challenges for firms, respectively. However, nearly all districts cited one or more signs of a cooling labor market, such as larger applicant pools, lower turnover, more selective hiring. The pace of wage growth was characterized as moderate in four places, as modest in two places, as slight in St. Louis, that's six, seven places. And they expected, expected is not seeing. Expected wage pressure to ease and wage growth to fall over the next year. Prices, six, half, Noted that their prices were slight or moderate increases, two noted moderate increases. Five districts noted overall prices had subsided to some degree in the prior period. While these offered, others indicated no significant shift in price pressure. Others, there's none left. They accounted for 11, <laughs> they say others. Um, firms in most districts cited examples of steady or falling input prices, especially manufacturing. Uh, more discounting by auto dealers, which is why we had a rush to people to come in and buy cars. Districts also noted that their increased consumer price sensitivity had forced retailers to narrow their profit margins. Uh, premium increases property and casualty insurance for health insurance continue to impact many firms. Th this is a big problem. The, prop the, the rising cost of uh, property casualty insurance, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, it's all going up like crazy. That's sucking money away from other places. You have to have the insurance, so you just have to cut back on other things. And of course, it impacts profit margins. So Boston, economics down slightly, regional activity declined slightly. Again, record high markets, this is not what you want to see, okay? When your market looks like this, you don't want to hear this. <laughs> Economic activity was down. Economic activity slightly declined. Business activity held steady after falling most of 2023. So it fell all year long, and now it's steadily at the bottom. Uh, district activity edged up. So Cleveland, but then you have to say, well, Cleveland, it's a clean, tiny little market. Richmond. Regional activity grew mildly. There you go. Consumer spending was flat to increasing modeling. Uh, Non-financial service demand, commercial estate activity was little change. Trade and trucking volumes were down modestly. Residential housing softened. What was good then? Employment and wages rose modestly and inflation moderated. What was good about this? The regional economy grew mildly in recent weeks as consumer spending was flat. I don't get that. Atlanta, economic activity grew at a slow pace. Chicago, economic activity was up modestly. St. Louis, economic activity remained unchanged. Minneapolis, district economic activity was down. Kansas City, economic activity was declining. Dallas, economic activity expanded. So Dallas is our star. All right, so that's what we've got so far. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to have Claude compare the two. I can get back to the page that has it. 
Now I'm going to find 2023. How do I find that? Oh, no. They don't have prior years? Shoot. Monetary policy. Documents. Fed minutes. How do I find the beige book? I thought we'd be able to compare the last beige book. Okay. So there's beige books. Ah, November 2023, Beige Book Archive. Here we go. Now we're getting somewhere. Oh, that was the last one. See, the reports used to be different. They they broken them up, which makes it really confusing for us. All right. So I guess we want the same national summary to keep things consistent. Whoops. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. Please compare that to the November 29, 2023 beige book and let us know what has changed between the two reports. All right, so let's see what he has to say here. So Claude's summary of the Beige Book is economic activity is largely unchanged or growing modestly across most districts. Consumer spending provided some boost over the holidays but has since moderated. Manufacturing activity declined in most districts. The strong dollar and softening demand was cited as drags. Interest rates. So, so, you know, when you see this, this is what's important about stuff like this. When you see this sort of statement, um, why did economic activity decline? Strong dollar and softening demand. So we want to look for consumer confidence, which is coming out on Friday. How does that look? How are consumers feeling? But also the dollar, if the dollar gets stronger, then this is going to continue to impact manufacturing activity. So it gives us a clue as to what's going to happen on the economic front by being careful and watching these indicators closely. Interest rates declining from high levels was cited as a source of optimism. But again, this hasn't actually happening. Not actually happened. It's something people are hoping will happen which is that same, now you're into the bias, right? Now we're back into the investment bias. There are people, people want rates to come down so much that they believe it. It's a Santa Claus thing. They wish rates would come down. That would fix it. They believe it will fix everything. It won't, by the way, but they, they want to think it will. So while concerns remain about office vacancies, oh, so there are still concerns about office vacancies. That's not going to change. Overall demand, again, we look at the consumer confidence and the 2024 election uncertainty, not going to change either. We're looking at a pretty tight election. Labor markets. Job growth slowed with signs of cooling and on hiring and wage pressures. This included larger applicant pools, blah, blah, blah. We saw we read that. Most districts expect wage pressures to ease further in 2023. So again, hope. They hope wage pressures will ease. They hope that labor supply and demand will rebalance. Price increases continue decelerating across districts driven by falling input costs and increased consumer price sensitivity. So that's not a good thing for, for the economy. It's not good if the consumers are not willing to pay the high prices and it forces the retailers and, and manufacturers to have lower margins. That's not going to, that will not play well into Q1. Um, oh, even, he even says that. <laughs> They're forcing retailers to accept narrow profit margins. 
See, he's a good analyst. Uh, insurance and healthcare costs remain a burden, right? We talked about that. Most firms expect inflation to moderate further in 2023. So again, hoping doesn't mean it's going to happen. In summary, economic momentum is slowing across sectors, though consumers provide a temporary holiday boost. The long anticipated rebalancing in labor market seems to be working, which is good. That means the Fed gets to, that's what the Fed was trying to stop. Um, but the problem is they stopped too soon and the, and the laborers haven't caught up with inflation. So everybody's just cutting back and that's not good. You know, on the whole, it's not a good solution. Interest rates declining from high levels offer optimism, though weak demand and the strong dollar weigh on manufacturing. Risks remain around the durability of slowing inflation and the impact of lower rates on growth. All right. So this is, this is where AI is really good because it's such a pain in the ass to do something like this yourself. So here's a comparison. The January report specifies more districts reporting declining activity. That's an important thing, isn't it? The January report, more districts reporting declining activity. This is, I mean, right here, the value of AI is indescribable, right? It's like picking out important key information that matters, that matters more than this report on the beige book. The summary of the beige book is not as important as saying, here's what changed. November cited strong consumer spending providing a boost. January says retail was mixed and consumer spending on discretionary items declined. Manufacturing went from mixed in November to mostly declining in January. This is really important stuff. Bank lending weakened a bit more in January, especially for real estate. Oh my God. This is starting to sound pretty bad. Um, January indicates job growth slowed from modest to moderate to flat. Easing wage pressures consistent in both, but January notes some declines in starting wages. January says skilled worker shortages persist, while November specified auto and engineering skills. Prices, both show price increases moderating, but January says they remain elevated. January cites rising insurance and utility costs, while November highlighted falling input prices. So the main themes are a broadening economic weakness, especially in manufacturing and further cooling in labor demand and price pressures, but risk remain to the durability of disinflationary trends. The tone grew more cautious on growth while staying consistent on inflation, but still high. All right, so that's those are great notes by Claude, super great notes on Claude. And let's put that into chat so people know what's going on. Do, 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 do. 10 comments, comment search. I can't put a comment in because I'm not logged in. WP. Uh, do, do, do. Sign me in. That's me. Hopefully that's me. <laughs> Back to Okay. Hmm. Dun, 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 dun. See, this is all the work I do behind the scenes. Okay, so um, the beige book is out.
All right, and where are you, dude? Here you are. So copy that. And now, cause, see, you think I don't do any work when I do this, but I'm doing a lot of work. Copy and that and paste. See how much. You know, and I'll tell you something. Hang on. Let me know if it's unnecessary. There we go. Lovely. All right. So here's the thing. When I put up the AI commentary, it's not that I'm not doing the reading and it's not that I'm not, you know, verifying the information, so on and so forth. Like you just saw, I mean, I'm looking at it myself, I'm checking it out, but the reality is I'm not going to write all these words. And these summaries are very useful. They give you, a, especially when we go back on them, because this would take me too long and I would be typing and typing and typing. I'm just, it, it just takes away from other time. This way I get to read and read and read. And when I see something important, I go to the, I go to the box and I say, here, summarize that so people can, can understand it. Instead of me having to sit there and go through the thing carefully line by line by line and picking out all these points. He did an excellent job. I don't disagree with what he said. Therefore, I'm going to put up the AI's commentary on the thing. Uh, I'm working with them and teaching them to get better and better and more and more like me, so I have less and less things to correct. But what it does is it, it gives it, it's for for the readers, for the people who are in the chat room and reading this stuff. It gives you more words and more and and organized, and and not just me saying, "Well, I think the beige book kind of I, I think there's a problem here because I'm seeing a decline in activity." That would be my comment. If I was writing, I would say what I see is a weakness that you you know it's it's not the kind of thing you want to see when you're looking at record highs now he didn't say that so i would still have to say that if i was going to i'll comment on this later in chat but since i'm talking to you guys i said that that was the first thing i said so my main point on it is this is not the kind of stuff you want to see when it's record highs we're we're seeing between the two reports some definite declines in in overall areas and again not what you want when you want to try to make new highs on the market so we need to be cautious into earnings. That's what this is telling me. We need to be very cautious into earnings. We need to take things with a grain of salt until we see what's really happening in the economy. And we know what to watch. Watch out for the strong dollar. Watch out for too much inflation in January. Watch out for the cost of insurance uh, and things like that. Insurance shipping we know is going through the roof. And again, this is what I want to be spending my time on. So I want to spend my time on looking at stuff. Not, I'd still be writing this freaking report. I'd still be writing that information down. I want to be looking more stuff up. I want to be finding out more facts. How is the Baltic Dry Index doing? Well, that's interesting. Exactly not what I thought. What the hell? How is the Baltic Dry Index dropping like that when the Red Sea is having this whole thing? I would have thought the shipping rates would be going up. So now I'm now I'm really concerned. <laughs> so I got to find my friend Bing. Where is he? Go to webinar. No. Uh oh. No. So I want to find uh, Edge, Microsoft, Microsoft Edge. Oh, and they really messed this thing up. Like, it's like they don't actually want you to use the, the AI anymore. Like they made it not easy to find. Um, Bing AI. Bing chat. 
Oh, now it's called Copilot. There we go. Okay. Hmm. I'm confused as I just looked at the Baltic Dry Index, and it's been going lower. Today is Jan, what is it, the 17th? 2024. It's been going lower. Despite the Red Sea and Panama Canal issues. Can you please I mean, can China's uh, slowdown be affecting it that much? And again, he's not necessarily going to know what he's talking about, but it gives me places to look. It gives me ideas of things to check out. So the Baltic uh, Index is an average. I know what it is. Uh, it is leading because of changes in the index reflect supply and demand for important materials. The BDI has been going lower since November, despite the Red Sea and Panama Canal. Um, there are several possible reasons for the decline. Seasonal factors, the demand for dry bulk commodities usually declines in the first two to three months uh, as the winter weather affects construction and industrial activity. Congestion relief, there has been significant reduction in congestion at Brazilian ports, particularly at Santos, which is the main hub of iron ore and soybeans. This has improved the availability and efficiency of ships with reduced waiting times. Interesting. Oversupply of ships. The global feed of dry bulk carries has grown faster than demand, creating an imbalance in the market. According to the Baltic Exchange, the total dry bulk fleet capacity has increased by 5% last year, while demand only grew 3.6% last year. Interesting. Alternate routes. Some shippers have opted to avoid the Red Sea and Panama Canal issues by taking longer routes around. This reduces demand for ships. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Regarding. Hmm. Don't the longer routes, we talked about this last week, don't the longer routes require more total ships on the water at any given time in order to maintain delivery flow. And while he's answering that, let's take a look at what his link is here. The International Business Times. Ugh, what's it doing? Ugh, it's uh, apparently blocked. When you use this site, we collect personal. Oh, here you go. I guess you can. Ex Let's reject the one. See, oh, there you go. <laughs> the escalating crisis in the Red Sea, for instance, Panama Canal drought, causes severe shipping delays from Asia to the U.S., particularly heavy goods. Carries the rerouting uh, with alternate routes increasing transit times 20 to 30 cents, exactly what we talked about last week. Like 2020 supply chain disruptions, these delays may lead to port and warehouse overloads. What does that mean? Like 2020's disruptions, reviving fears of renewed supply, this could lead to container shortages. Oh, I guess overloads at the sending uh, warehouses, he means. Um, this could lead to container shortages, shipping, soaring costs, and cost push inflation. The containerized freight index has almost doubled, increasing the points since the beginning of 2024. Historically, the freight index reached an all high time in January. Rising freight rates could have far reaching consequences. To assess the situation, 
the how serious the situation is severe. The Panama Canal drought has led to several rerouting of shipping vessels, drastic shift in Trans-Pacific, Transatlantic. This rerouting, mainly through the Suez Canal and the Cape of Good Hope, has caused substantial delays and effectively half the container shipping capacity. Such disruptions severely impact primarily the retail. How heavy is disproportionately impacted due to weight restrictions? Uh, oh, that's interesting. Heavier goods. So because the canal is shallower, this is the problem with the Panama Canal, it's shallowing up. So because of that, the weight restrictions are, um, a, a, a heavier ship has a harder time going through, which means heavier goods are harder to send through the canal. How are they affected? Extended transit time. So in other words, if you're buying furniture or cars or things like that, you can face extended delays. Uh, longer waiting, the redirection of cargo from the West Coast, putting drain on the ports. You see what I go through just to like find out one little fact? It's so crazy. In the short term situation, may worsen. I don't get it. I don't see anything there that's going to tell me otherwise. Ah, we're bingo. What, did, what, what just happened? Go to webinar, no. Did I just accidentally close it? No, it's right there. <laughs> That's a good question. Longer routes do require more total ships in the water at any given time, but they also reduce the frequency of shipments and the turnaround time of each ship. For example, a ship that used to make four round trips per month may now only make two round trips per month. I get that. This means a ship is spending more time at sea, less time at port, where it can load and unload and pick up. Therefore, the longer routes reduce the effective supply of ships. Yes, I know that. And containers. Therefore, longer routes reduce the effective supply of ships and containers in the area and lower the BDI. I don't get that. The longer routes also have an impact on shipping costs and prices around the world. The longer routes increase the fuel consumption and emissions of ships. This is all the stuff we talked about last week, as well as the transit time on the phone. These factors may lead to higher freight rates and surcharges, as well as higher prices. However, the impact of the longer routes may vary depending on the cargo availability. Alternative. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Hmm. Let me just check something. I'm sorry, but. This is where I'm struggling. What are the mechanics? <laughs> I like this. This is what I do. <laughs> Suppose there are 10 ships available to transport. Each ship can carry 100,000 tons. The distance between Brazil and China is 12,000 miles, and the average speed of the ship. Wow, it's like an SAT thing. And the answer, therefore, it takes about 42 days to complete a one day voyage, 84 days for round trip. Assuming there is a constant demand for iron ore in China, each ship can make 4.3 trips per year. The annual supply of iron ore, blah, 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 is 4.3 million tons. Now, suppose there is a security issue in the Red Sea that forces the ships to take a longer route around Africa. The distance between Brazil and China via the Cape of Good Hope is around 15,000 miles for 52 days, blah, blah, blah. Each ship can only make 3.5 trips per year, annual supply, blah, blah, blah. As you can see, the longer route reduces the I get that. Brazil, China is one of the main components of the BDI. It reduces the supply of ships. This means the shippers have to charge higher rates to cover their cost to maintain. And the buyer have to make, pay more for the imports. This increases the BDI for this route. However, the longer route also reduces the demand for ships and other routes that are affected by the Red Sea issues, such as the Australia, China, or in the Atlantic Pacific. That's because the ships that are used to transport iron ore from Brazil to China are now spending more time and less time at ports where they can pick up other cargoes or empty containers. This creates a surplus of ships and containers in these routes, which lowers the BDI. Oh, I get it. Oh, Jesus, that's, that's deep. Therefore, the net effect of the longer route on the BDI depends on the relative importance. So in other words, 
there's an offset. There's some things are some things are getting cheaper, and this is why that port congestion is easing because there's less ships at port at any given time. There's more ships at sea, makes the ports more efficient. This is wow, this is crazy, huh? Less ships at sea. I'm sorry, more ships at sea means less ships at port. Means the ports are not backed up. Means they can load quickly. Means the shorter routes that are not affected. Wow. So the shorter routes. So what what he's saying is, if you imagine that there are long routes, right, especially the long routes that are that now have more ships at sea at any given time, but also have a have um. They're not, they don't really have more ships. They're just transporting less stuff. There is the same amount of ships more spread out. They're at sea for a longer period of time, so they hit the ports less often, which means that on a short route, like from the west coast of America to China, there's no Suez Canal, there's no Panama Canal. Therefore, those ships are running their normal routes faster and more efficiently because they, when they get to port, these big ships are not clogging up the port. There, because those ships are spending more time at sea. So there's an offset. So no, so and and the offset is enough that those ships are getting faster and cheaper, more so than the other ships are getting more expensive. Ah, it's really complex. That's that's. I missed that. I can't believe I didn't think of that. That's. I mean, that's a <laughs> logistically that is really complex. That's pretty cool though. Therefore, the net effect of the longer route on the BDI depends on the rel relative importance of the affected routes in the index. The Brazil-China route has a higher weighting than the other routes, the BDI will increase. And the other routes have a higher weighting, the BDI will decrease. In reality, BDI is a weighted average of several routes, and the weightings are not necessarily proportion to the actual cargo flows. There's another reason. Good explanation, Bing. Therefore, BDI may not accurately reflect the true supply and demand situation of the ball. That is freaking fantastic. Wow. Wow. Great job. Thanks. Okay, cool. Uh, now let's copy this. This is, this is one we save for the chat room, right? I don't copy the whole conversation. I wonder if I can do that. Do, 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 do. When you think you can export the chat or something? I think there was a way to do that. Huh. Oh well, can we do this? Do, do, do. Okay, we're done with you. And we'll put. See, I right there again. AI is amazing. We were confused as to why the Baltic dry index was lower, and I had this conversation with Shelba that. Let's give a shout out to Microsoft for that one. Okay. Hmm. I think it's worth it if I label these, right? Because um, although it's going to confuse the crap out of people. Why doesn't this open up? Oh, I know. It's opening it up. <laughs> it's opening it up up there. So that's Shellbot. And then here... Up. I'm going to back up here. Here's me. OK. 
Okay, so now I copy that. Okay, we don't care about that part. I mean, this is this is intense stuff. You know, my, I don't. There's not a lot of times when I learn something like this. It's like. This would have taken me so much research to figure out. And so that's why I'm so excited about it. It's great. Um, which we'll see. Okay. Let me try to space it out so it doesn't look so shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me put it in the shell bot. Oops, where do you go? Here we go. I mean, that is intense. That was unbelievably complex. Uh, logistic, you know, global logistical problem that he has completely figured out and explained for us. I mean, that's just phenomenal. And and by the way, so and this this is where I am bullish about the markets overall because this is the, the age we're in now, where literally, I mean, that was essentially like getting a college course in logistics, and it's. It, it's not just that he answered the question. He explained it in a way that I now know more about uh, um, about shipping than I knew before after 20 years of learning about shipping. And it was presented in a good, concise manner that most people could could read that and figure it out. And as people get better at using AI, as people start getting to be able to, it's, it's about asking the right questions, right? I mean, he even said to me, good question, works. <laughs> what I ask him? Um, oh, no, that was here. He's like, I understand your confusion. <laughs> now, because I was confused, he went into like a teacher mode and decided to like lay it out for me in a way that that exactly was perfect for me to understand it, which I'm really happy about. Um, I mean that just that just perfectly laid out exactly what's happening with the numbers, which which gives it another layer of of depth to the to the response. Mm -mm. And you know, but this is based on the fact that I know how to ask him back a question. I'm saying I'm sorry, but here's here's the part of what you said that I don't understand. And that's important too. It's it's again, it goes back to the same thing we talk about in investing. You've got to know yourself. You've got to understand what you can and can't do. And you've got to be willing to say to the machine, I'm sorry, I don't get it. What are you talking about? But you can do that. And it's going to make people all around the world, people doing job after job after job more effective and it's going to create efficiencies at every level of the company. As, as people get more comfortable with the AIs, you know, as CEOs are comfortable saying to the AI, I'm sorry, I have this business problem. I don't understand what I'm doing. I need help. The AIs can actually help. They can solve problems. They can explain why something is going on. They can tell you something that uh, you, you know, like he said before, it was counter. He, told, he said it was counterintuitive. Oh, right here he says it's counterintuitive. 
Um, so he know he understands that it's counterintuitive. He explains it in a way to say, okay, here's where I can alleviate your confusion. Here's where I can clarify something. You know, I, I could have spent a day reading stuff trying to figure out what it was about the Baltic Dry Index that was doing that. But when he says it here, it's all done. It's like, boom, I got it. Okay. And what did that take us? Like 15 minutes? That's that's an incredible thing. When you condense a day into 15 minutes and solve a problem like that, you know, and and uh my, and, and my time for things like that is really valuable as a consultant. When I consult businesses, I would have spent a day looking that stuff up. I come back to them with an answer in 15 minutes and tell them exactly what's going on. And, can, and, and it's already written for me. I don't even have to do anything. I'm just like, oh, here's what's happening. Here's why. Which is what I do in the website. It's what I do in the chat room, right? I put up a thing because I'm like, well, he answered it as well as I possibly could have. That makes perfect sense. And the reason I do these exchanges in the in the uh, uh, in the chat a lot, I want people, I want everybody to become as good as me at using AI. I want people to, to get comfortable with it because it's going to change your life. It's going to make you more effective at anything you're doing. You've got to you've got to use these things. You've got to get comfortable with it, and it's got to become a part of your daily life. You can't just say, "Oh, Phil does that AI stuff." That's not a good thing. You've got to do that AI stuff. It's going to be on the new phones. It's going to be in new computers when you buy a computer. It's going to be in all your Microsoft products now. It's like when you when you open up Office, it's going to be there. Use it. It's it's uh, it's a revolution. It's not an evolution. This is a revolution in the way we use technology, and it's absolutely the future. There's no question about it. The ability of the of these computers to take anything. I looked at the Baltic Dry Index. I didn't understand why it was going down. I now completely understand why it's going down. That is, I, I don't know if I can convey to you guys the efficiency of something like that. The fact that I, I now know something and understand the mechanics of this thing better than I did before is huge. It affects so many other things that I think about and consider when I'm looking at logistics. Like, in other words, where does, you know, when you look at a company and say, oh, they, they do shipping. Okay, so before I would have looked at a company and say, well, they do a lot of shipping. That's bad. But no, if the company does a lot of shipping from California to China or from China to California, that's not bad then. I didn't really think about the different routes having different, having their own internal dynamics. I was thinking all shipping is delayed. That's not true. If you think about it, the shipping that went that way is delayed, and that's certain things. And for the Panama Canal, that didn't even occur to me that heavier stuff is being affected, but lighter stuff like a ship, you know, ships fill up, right? So a ship full of, of uh, Beanie Babies is going to weigh a lot less than a ship full of uh, IKEA furniture. So, so, so in other words, the, the Beanie Baby Company is fine. They can still send their shipfuls of Beanie Babies through the Panama Canal. Not, it's not the Panama Canal 100% that's a problem. It's heavy ships in the Panama Canal. Certain manufacturers get affected. Certain routes get affected. Um, you know, and and that's what leads you to these delays. And then, as 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 uh, he was exampling, the Brazil China route is not. Um, you know the Brazil China route is not going to be the same as a, as a as a as the uh, Australia China route. That's a completely different thing because Australia to China doesn't have any of those blockades. You know, whereas Brazil usually goes through the Panama Canal. That's a problem for Brazil, but not for everything. Only for the heavier goods. In the Red Sea, everything is blocked off. So it's just a whole other layer of considerations that give us a more efficient way and a more effective way to evaluate companies just from this little stupid thing. And I know I'm a geek and I get excited about stuff like this, but really you guys, it's, it's exciting that this happens. It's exciting that this can be done. And uh, Stefan says, anything on Barrick Gold, it's down 10% since yesterday. And no, gold's down. Look at look, it, Barrick's down because gold is down. It's uh, long term. I still like both of them. But the thing that, you know, Barrick Gold, well, well here, where's uh, futures? Nope, not that. Well, here you go. So here's gold. So that's Barrick, right? Oh, that's unfair. Holy cow. 
<laughs> That's not right. All right. So. Dun, 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 medals. What matters with Barrett is they're going to report their 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 fourth quarter of last year, right? And this doesn't go back far enough. Well, I guess we can do this. So last year, in October, November, December, gold was October, November was sixteen seventeen hundred dollars. Then it went up to eighteen hundred dollars. So let's say the average was seventeen fifty for argument's sake in in the third quarter of last year. So now in October, November, December, it went from nineteen fifty to twenty one hundred. So it's about two thousand dollars here. So from seventeen fifty to twenty one hundred. So it is highly unlikely. So uh, two fifty divided by 1750 is 14%, okay? So did Barrick's cost rise 14%? Probably not. So they, I, don't, I, I do not believe that's the case at all with Barrick. I don't think their, their uh, production costs jump 14%. Also, you have to consider that with Barrick, their profit is above the, the line. So in other words, uh, last year, uh, do, 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 do. This is all the work I do when you guys ask a question. <laughs> this is my normal work when you guys ask a question. So, um, in 2023, well, in 2022, they dropped 432 to the bottom line. Last year, they dropped 1400 to the bottom line. All right, and we can break that down by the quarter, but let's just for argument's sake say they only they made um hang on. How much is gold per ounce? A couple of thousand dollars, right? So uh one one four two nine in twenty twenty three. Um so we're gonna uh, oh wait, sorry, one, two, three. That's millions, right? No, billions. There you go. So we divide that by four for the quarters, assuming steady production. We divide that now by 1750. So it's 6, 1.6 million ounces. That sounds about right for them. So 1.6 million ounces of gold, basically, and they make 1.4 uh, billion dollars. One point four billion or one point six million, they're making a thousand, making a thousand dollars an ounce. That sounds right, yeah. Because their extraction cost is X, right? So their extraction cost about fifty percent. So, but here's the point. Sorry, so the one point six. So yeah, they're making about a thousand an ounce. So they're making a thousand an ounce. When if the production cost didn't go up that significantly and the profits went up that significantly, they're not just going to make, you don't think of it in terms of, oh, they're going to make $250 more. It's all profit, or it's mostly profit, that $250, and that's going to have a significant impact on their profit because most of the extra money that they're collecting for the gold doesn't affect their, their bottom line isn't affected, their costs aren't affected. It's just more money, which becomes instantly more profit per ounce when they sell the gold at a higher price. So we know they're selling gold at a 14% higher price in, in this year. Um, so then we go back to, all right, so now, now we say, okay, so what was the, where was Barrick Gold last year? And Barrick Gold last year, when they reported in January, and they reported their 1750, they went up from 1690. Well, no, I'm sorry. So, so in January, when they reported, they went up to 19. People loved it. And now they're so now they're coming back down for some reason to the lows of last year, even though gold is significantly higher. Now, is gold going to keep collapsing? There's some of that built in here too. People may be betting that gold is going to completely collapse. But they're certainly going to have a much better quarter 
than they had last year. So I would absolutely be uh, be buying more or repositioning or whatever for this. Because I think they're going to be in great shape. I think this is silly. And that's how I end up answering a question. So basically, I do all that research, and then I say, no, I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see. All right. Oh, they had news about production, Stefan says. All right, let's see what he says. Barrett Gold reports lower preliminary gold reports, lower output for 2023. Um, oh, Barrett Gold reports lower preliminary output 2023. Well, it keeps repeating. Oh, da, 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 da. Oops, what happened here? Sorry. Okay, whatever. Anyway, so they have lower output. Let's talk about it in chat, then we'll do a little bit more research and find out exactly what they did say. And we'll see if we can figure it out. But that's a little more research. But on the whole, unless it's significantly lower output, or again, we go back to our friend Bing, if I can find it, which I can't. Oh, there he is. Okay. Um, what is wrong with this? Do do do. Oh. What on earth? It's like it's broken. Oh, it's like my whole computer broke. That was weird. I shut you down. I shut you down. Whoop. No, you're still there. Doesn't want to go away. Ooh, it's like broken. I'm going to have to restart the computer. Interesting. How about that one? Okay. So, um, Barrick Gold recently in 17202 or lowered their production uh, forecast for 2023 was it really so much that it justified a 10% drop in the stock? And again, you don't know, this is very important though, just like I talked about the fake news with the uh, Elon Musk, you don't know if it's telling you an accurate thing. So, company produced 4 million ounces of gold, which was lower than the expected 4.2. So it was a significant downturn. They expected 4.4, let's say, and it was 4.05. That's 10% less production. So that's a valid, uh, that's a valid reduction there. A company also lowered their 2024 guidance to 3.2, citing equipment issues at Pueblo Mine. These factors may have contributed to the draw investors. However, some analysts believe that the stock price drop was overdone and Barrett Gold still has strong fundamentals. I believe that too. The company reported higher fourth quarter production of sales in gold and copper, driven by performance at Cortez and Phoenix. The company also announced a potential acquisition of First Quantum, which we know about. Moreover, the company has solid balance sheet, we know that. Therefore, the 10% drop is a temporary setback and rather than the reflection of long-term value, the company may recover, blah, blah, blah. Okay, um, all sounds good to me. I'd wanna check into a little bit further, but it sounds legit. And I certainly would not be selling my Barrett Gold stock, not that I was ever going to anyway. But again, this is how we shorten our time for research. It gives me a lot of pointers to look to and, and, and all the links, right? So I can read this myself. I can see what it says. I can do a little bit more research. But in general, the same reason I like Barrett Gold at 15 last year, I still like him at 15 this year because people are underestimating them in the long term. And that's very likely where we are. All right. Looks like I have to reboot this computer because that's not a good thing when you click on something and it gives you bings. Uh, that's why they call it bing, I guess. <laughs> all right. Thanks for coming, everybody. I appreciate it. Uh, have a great day. We will do this again next week. All right. Take care.